welcome to First Baptist Church. We're glad you have you with us this morning. We're glad to have you live streaming. This is strange, interesting times, and I'm actually preaching to an empty room, but I know we have people on and following us, and we're glad that God has given us technology to stay in communication. Glad that you're here. If you are a visitor, you just ran across us on the web, go ahead and uh, there's a comment section. Let us know who you are, and we're glad you're visiting us. If you're a member and just part of the family, go ahead and still comment in that comment section so we can communicate during this time and so we can keep the fellowship going. Again, we're glad to have you with us. Some announcements for this week. I know there's been lots of calls if the church is going to be canceled, if activities. Uh, as of now, March has been canceled, um, but pastor is coming back tomorrow, and we'll be discussing things. Uh, we are taking it one step at a time, but all your information should be on the web. Please go to the web. Our website is First Baptist Church on Wellington. Um, dot, uh, dot org, and so go ahead and check that out and keep in connected with us. Also, if you go to the contact page and off to the side, you can sign up for our email updates. We started that this week so we can keep updated. Uh, you updated on everything going on, and we'll make sure all the cancellations or the events that are keep on going will be there. Uh, again, Wednesday, we will not have Awana since uh, the schools are still canceled, and we will go from there. Thank you again for joining us. Um, as we take our focus into God's Word, let's go ahead and Second uh, Corinthians 4, 6 says this, for God, he said, let light shine out of darkness, as shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you are considering this time as a dark time, or, or if you have another dark time in your life, but the fact is that God's light does show. It's a good segue to our song this morning, Sunshine in My Soul Today. Uh, Lord willing, there'll be um, words on the screen, but if you have a hymn book close to you on your couch, uh, it's 747 in the hymn book, Sunshine in My Soul Today. Let's sing it together. We'll sing verse 1, 2, and 4. There is sunshine in my soul.
trust our Lord. Let's go ahead and sing, I'm so glad. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, country, we can still lift our voices to our God. At this time, this will be the time we have uh, received the offering, but uh, of course we will not do it. Uh, but we're so thankful for those who have already sent in their tithe to keep the church running. Um, just we appreciate you continual worship through giving. But Andrea, she'll go ahead and just play a, we'll call an offertory, but she'll be playing a uh, song for you right now. Gracious Father in heaven, we are thankful for what you have done. Thank you for the opportunity to come and worship in your house this morning. And when we say worship in your house, you know what? We realize that the church is not this building, but the church is your people. The church is not these four walls, but the church is our, the family of God scattered around the country right now worshiping and uplifting. We're glad that even though the church is online, church is not online. Church is in our worship together. And Lord, we just ask that uh, through everything going on with our government and with our nation and with this virus and with panic and with uncertainty, that we will come to the feet of Jesus with all of our cares, with all of our worries, and realize that you are the God who is in control. You are the God who is still on the throne. And we're so glad that we are worshiping you this morning. Lord, we just ask again for your blessing upon this service, upon our worship to you. We pray this in the name of your name, of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our next song is... 543 till the storm passes by in the dark of the midnight. Let's go ahead and sing that together.
But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, and he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he said was still when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring on out the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry, for my this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll get to our sermon this morning. Our Father in heaven, again, we're glad that we can come into your presence. We're glad that we can participate in worship by reading your word and learning from what you have to teach us this morning. Lord, I truly want these to be your words. I want this to be something that will help your people this morning. Help me remember the things I've studied, but put your spirit in my mouth. Let me speak the word you will have me to speak. Lord, we are so grateful for an example you have given us of a true father. Let's look at that now, this morning. Amen. We need to understand where this story is taking place. There's two contexts that we need to be clear on. We need to know the context culturally, but we also need to know the context scripturally. You know, I'm not a Mideastern expert, but there are many preachers and commentators that have offered great insights on what would be the culture implications of this parable Jesus is telling. We need to realize that this was a Middle Eastern village. It was in the Middle East. It's, it's not a small town in the middle of Ohio, but it's a small village, peasant village, a poor village in Israel, in the Middle East. He will be also talking, as we will see in a few minutes, he, he will be talking to Pharisees. And we know these men as the religious elite, these people who have um, followed the law of the Bible to a T in their mind. They have a certain expectation of people, of themselves. They have a certain view of what is honor, what is dishonor, what is worship and what is not worship. And so we need to understand that while Jesus is telling this story, there's going to be some thought processes in their mind. They're going to be, yes, I understand that all of that is wrong. But we not only need to know um, to, uh, the group of people Jesus was addressing, but we also need to understand um, the certain situation. Um, we need to under realize the purpose of the story, the context. This is in Luke 15, and at the end of Luke 14, um, we see that Jesus is saying, um, listen up, those who want to hear. And all of a sudden, those who come around him in the first chapter, uh, first verses of Luke 15 is this. Um, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, So Christ, this is actually, Christ is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, this is at the end of his three-year ministry. Just weeks, months ahead is his death. 
and he's heading to Jerusalem, and he is saying, those who want to hear, come listen to me. And the only ones that came were the sinners, the tax collectors, the low, uh, the peasants, the low among them. And they come to listen to him um, speak. And the Pharisees say, oh, you're fellowshipping with unclean. You're fellowshipping with sinners. They're using this to associate. If you're going to associate with these scum, are you, if you're going to associate with sinners, then you must be of the devil. You must be uh, not righteous, not worthy of our, um, our association. And so he turns to them. He said, instead of speaking to these people who want to hear, I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to speak for you because you guys need to hear. And he's saying, and so he starts with three stories. First story was the stray sheep. How the shepherd went back for the one lost sheep and left the 99 sheep that followed him because he had compassion with that one that fell away. He is saying, the reason why I associate with these sinners is because I have come to seek and save that which is lost. He says later in Luke 19.10, I do this because it is my father's joy. It is God's joy to save lost sinners. His second story was that there was a coin that was lost and there was rejoicing when that one coin was finally found. And Jesus is teaching them what God really rejoices in. He's telling these Pharisees that you really don't know who God is and what he rejoices in. Now we jump into our story that we know so well as the story of the prodigal son. But even though the name suggests that it is about this wayward son, I would remind us that he is not the only character in the story. There's two other characters that are important, and one that we're going to focus in depth today is the father. And why do I talk about the context? It is because these Pharisees who is talking to, uh, he, who he is talking to are offended as they will be offended at his father. This father is going to do everything wrong in the book. He is going to be doing things that would give dishonor to his family. And in their minds, he's going to be what the title of the sermon is this morning a failure as a father, a father's failure. First, we see that the freedom the father offered. We meet the father with two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. We see that the outrageous request of this prodigal son. You know, prodigal is a term we use um, somebody who is wasteful, a person who is senselessly um, uh, extravagant, self-indulgent. And when Jesus would tell this story, how this son came to the Father and said, give me what I, you owe me, the Pharisees would aghast. They would say, no, he didn't. No way would he say that. They would say, he has no respect for his father. Uh, respect for the heritage of generations of his father family providing for his father and then for his future self. In fact, a Middle Eastern village would view this as saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I know once you die, I'm going to get my inheritance, but I can't wait until you die. I have plans. I have big plans, and your life is encroaching on those plans. Dad, just die already or give it to me now. They would be offended. They would think this would be disrespectful, and it was. You know, the inheritance was given after the father died, but he wasn't, he was done waiting. He said, you are in my way. You are in the way of my plans. Not only do we see the outrageous request, but then we see the outrageous response of the father. He says, sure, I'll give it to you. And they gave it, he gave it to him. This was dishonor now to the community, to the standards, to the um, rituals that have been set for years. The son broke the Ten Commandments of honoring his parents. 
everyone knew that the son was making a gusty request. In some ways, it was like committing suicide. In the Old Testament, there, if, some, uh, if you dishonored your parents, disrespected them, disobey, you would be taken out to the city, and you would be stoned. Now imagine, teens, right now, that this morning your mom asked you to do something. You say, um, wait, mom, I'll do it when I'm done with this video game. Then that's disrespect, that's bad talking, that's not obeying right away. And because of that, they would call up the local police, say, hey, my son disrespected me. And, and they take you to prison, they go ahead and they do the lethal injection or whatever is um, common in your state. And you're put to death because of your dishonor to your family. Okay, that's extreme, I know. But God wanted to make a point that he put the family in charge and he wanted to um, keep in, uh, and there was a respect that was required. But of course, these Jews would have taken much for, um, march much far further than what God intended. And so God was showing, God was teaching them something. So they would expect him to be put to death. Or at the very least, he would expect them to take Alazine and slap him on the face, saying, um, out of disrespect. It deserved that humiliating slap on the face. That was the Jewish gesture to show rebuke for such a disdain on the part of a young son who had to benefited from everything the family had and probably all of the accumulated riches of the generations before. And that's the way he treats his father was the head of the home and had the most honor. He had the nerve. In fact, it would not be uncommon to be publicly shamed or disowned and have a funeral for the death of the son. Later we see in verse 24 and 32, now my son is dead. Because in their minds he was. He betrayed the family and left the home. But thirdly, we see of the father's freedom. When there's the father's freedom, we see then the outrageous outcome of the son's decision. It says, and not now many days, not many days after. The young son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He liquefied his assets. He didn't want the land that his parents accumulated over years and worked hard to maintain. He wanted the profit from the land. He didn't want all the hard work to maintain it. He wanted it now. Someone could buy it, um, but not until the father died, so he wanted it. He did not want to be responsible for the materials. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land. Famine wasn't his fault. That's life. This virus we're dealing with isn't our fault. Besides the fact of sin in the world. And evil brought on by us. But that's part of life. Bad things happen. And Christ is not showing that all sinners will come to this level. But that if God can show grace to someone this low, how much will he do for someone who has not fallen that far? We go on, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his field to feed swine. You know, he runs from God, goes out, lives a dissolute, rebellious life, and sends up a storm, winds up in the pits, winds up with absolute nothing, is completely bankrupt, bare. He's on skid row, he's walking in the streets, he has nothing, but you know, he's going to pick himself up. I've got to get a job. And for the first time, he has to work. And he finds this nobleman. The context of the, the verse and the Greek kind of points to that he was kind of beggar and he was falling. He was joined to this nobleman. And wherever this man went, 
Wherever he went, the son followed. And it finally got to the point where the man said, okay, fine, just go feed my pigs. Fourthly, though, in the freedom the father offered, we see a retentive son. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He saw how much his father's servants had. You know, these servants would have been day laborers. They weren't slaves. They were part of the family. And he treated these laborers, these individuals, more honorably and more things than the son had. He started seeing the graciousness of his father and saying, you know what, maybe my father isn't that bad. Everything that I thought was owed me, you know, there was a term that I'm not too thrilled about, but it's that white privilege. But you know, we do have privileges in America. And we do believe that there's stuff owed us that not necessarily is owed us. And we go and we ask for things. And he's trying to say, you know what, maybe my dad isn't as evil as I think he is. And just maybe he will let me back to serve. This leads us to our second main point, and that's the foolishness of the fathers demonstrated. The foolishness of the father is demonstrated. We see the freedom the father offered, and now we're going to even see more of his foolishness. First we see he foolishly looked. He's foolishly looking, it says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Typically what would happen if a son betrayed the honor of the family and he went away and finally he comes back, they will go ahead and lock him out of the city gates. And they won't let him in. And what will happen is, then they will send someone to the father and say, Hey, your son is back. And he said, Okay, I'm ready for him. Let him come. He might let him stay a day or two or three until he's ready to show his grace. And then finally, you will let the son walk through the streets where everybody can see him, in his filth, in his smell. And while he's walking through the streets, everybody sees him. They know who he is. They know that he left home. It will be a walk of humiliation all the way to the father. Finally, he would get to the house. He would go into the father. He would kiss his feet, not his hand, not the anything pleasant, but his dirty feet. And then maybe then, maybe then will the father let him in, as long as he knows that he knows his place. He will then grovel. Maybe he will be left back. But the context shows us that no, he was actually looking. And before he even had a chance to get to the gate, the father already knew he was coming. And the father already was there. And therefore, we see the second foolish thing he did. He was foolishly going. He actually went. And why go after him? Why don't you let him go through the city and, that, uh, and be humiliated? And that's the point. He got to him before he could be humiliated. You know, it was daytime. He did not want him to get to the village. In a culture filled with honor, he was being foolish. You know, you need to let him restore your honor because what he did to you. Up to this point, the Pharisees were agreeing, like, okay, good, he's going to get what's due. But then you see him foolishly going, and then we see him foolishly running. Now, why I'm making this such a point of not only is he going, but he's running, is this. Mid-Eastern men, Mid-Easterners in general, but men, noblemen, they don't run. They don't run. I'm 
going to read what one author said about this. He writes this. One of the main reasons why the Mid-Easterners of rank do not run is that traditionally they are all have been worn long robes. This is true both for men and women. No one can run in a long robe without taking it up into his or her hand. When this occur, occurs, the legs are exposed, which is considered humiliating. Clearly, he writes, exposure of the legs was considered shameful. The robes themselves reached to the ground to make sure this didn't happen. A quaint ruling for Sabbath states that if a bird crawls under your robe on the Sabbath, you may not catch it. Now, there's a problem. But you cannot catch it because you might have to expose your legs to do that. So it says, the suggested alternative is to sit very quietly and wait for the sundown so no one can see and to seize the bird further. On the Sabbath, you could smooth out your robe to make it look nice, but you couldn't lift it up. If your robe did not reach the ground and you didn't have a long one for the Sabbath, you had to take the hem out so that it touched the ground. Also, one should not jump or take long strides. One foot should be on the ground at all times. The reason for this last ruling is to assure that no part of the leg is ever exposed. But he runs. He exposes his ankles. Instead of letting his son come to a city to be humiliated, he runs and in likewise is humiliated. But then he then kisses him. This dirty, smelly, gross son. Fourthly, though, we see the forgiveness of the father gave. He adds to the foolishness and forgives all. This is absolutely unexpected. And this is where the story has its huge surprise. The father condescends, humbles himself out of this deep love for his son. He comes all the way down from his house to the dirt of the village, runs through bearing the scorn and the shame, throws his arms around the penitent believing sinner who is coming to him in his filthy, unclean rags. That father is doing exactly what Jesus did. Exactly what he did. He came down to our village to run the gauntlet and bear the shame and the slander and the mockery to throw his arms around us and kiss us and reconcile with us. The shock is all this happened without any what? Any work. Nothing the son could do. That's the shock. It was grace. As the next verse makes clear, the son understood it. Remember before the son said, let me go back, let me ask for forgiveness. And then um, I said, hey, and make me as one of your servants. But he doesn't do it this time. He says something different. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven which is like, I've sent up to heaven. It's so high, I can't understand. And in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then, it ends. Then it stops right there. It doesn't say, and make me as your servant. And I think the reason, it could be his arrogance, but I read some commentaries and I will agree with. He wasn't going to embarrass his father any further. His father is accepting him with open arms and he said, but, but wait, thank you for this gift, but I'd rather be your servant. Hey, thank you for doing all this for me and you humiliating yourself, but I just don't feel right. I need to do such and such to earn this back. And he realizes that with God's grace and mercy, or with his father's grace and mercy, that he would be doing his father much more disfavor without accepting. But how much do we do the same? God, thank you for your grace and mercy, but you know, I need to do this. And this is the whole 
concept of the Pharisees that they have been working their best to be the best Jewish people that they could be to earn God's favor. And at the end, they realize, uh, God's saying, you can't do anything. And when you ask me to do, to be worthy, you're getting rid of my grace I'm giving to you. He wasn't going to shame his father any further and say, but I have to do this. If we continue, verse 22, the father, but the father said unto his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they began to be married. We see the servants are running. The, the, the master said, hey, let's get it going. We can't stop any further. We can keep the, uh, my son is here. Let's, keep, let's get stuff started. Let's get the celebration going. We waited long enough. We see the quote. We see the highest honor he, he became bestowed, the ring. And so essentially what he does is lay claim to all that belongs potentially to the older son and say, it's all yours. And they would be saying, the Pharisees was, how could, would be saying, how could you reward this kind? How could you reward this kid? For the way he behaved and take the stuff that belongs to the guy who stayed home. This again is just beyond their comprehension. But that's exactly what it does. This part of uh, the, the fatty calf is something that they would have kept for a long time, made sure it was big, and when they killed it, they usually killed it maybe at a wedding. It was big enough to feed about 200 people he wanted to celebrate. The son entrusts his life to the father. And the father entrusts his resources to the son. The son is finally home. He is in the father's house. He's in the family. He has full access to all the riches of the father. And he joins with everyone in celebration. And celebrating the greatness of this event. Friends, this is where the story ends. But I want to talk to us just for a few more seconds. I don't know what God is doing in your life today. I don't know if you are wayward. But I do know this. Our nation has been wayward for a very long time. And it has creeped in the culture of our church. We have come to the Father and say, I know you want my fellowship, but my entertainment is more important. We come to God, our Father, and we say, I know I give you honor by giving you my time, but I give you it on Sunday mornings. The other, let me have it for my family. Let me have it for my time, for a time of fishing, for a time of hunting, fill in the blank. And to me it seems, for a long time we have filled our schedules way too long with so much stuff, but our Heavenly Father is not there. Or if He is, is on the schedule, it's a recurring Schedule, like to visit that rich uncle once in a while to make sure he doesn't write us out of his will. But again, this sermon is not about us. It's about this foolish father that does everything wrong to keep his honor, but he does it for the love of his, of his children. Family, May we this morning be reminded about the grace God has given us to all sinners. And also, let 
us be part of that, of the Father's plan on bringing all his children back to him. You know what, it's kind of funny that we have filled our schedules to the rim. And now all of a sudden, the last few weeks, we have nothing to do. Maybe this is God's grace upon our lives to say, hey, what, let's focus on what's real. Let's focus on what's important. I know schooling is important, but sometimes we have put schooling over our God. I know God has given us great things, activities, and sports, but maybe we have put our sports over our God. You know, family is important, but so many times, instead of having God first and then family, we put family and then God. I don't know what things you are, what situation, what, what in your life is keeping you away from God. You might not even know God as your Heavenly Father. And this is where I petition to you this morning that God is so gracious. You deserve humiliation, but God went down from heaven and was humiliated for us. We have a wage as sinners, and that is death, but God took that death upon himself because of his love for you, for me, for us. But I'm trusting most of us watching are saved, and we know our Heavenly Father as this gracious Heavenly Father, but we haven't dealt with the son yet, the other son. But many times we act like the other son and feel like we deserve certain things. Maybe we get angry at God's grace to others who need it. Maybe God is using you to show grace to others. May we trust that God, our Heavenly Father is a gracious Father. May we be doing the work to win souls Though it may be foolish to others, because we do not actually serve a foolish father, but a loving one. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you one more time that we can come to worship you this morning. We ask that, uh, that just with all this technology, we ask that it will be working and that it will help us and be a good way to keep worshiping together, even though we can't be in the church building. We thank you for this lesson about the Father who in many eyes, in, in the eyes of the world, he did stuff that was not right, was not, was not custom, that was foolish. But we know you are not foolish. And let us recognize today how much you love us and what you did for us on the cross and what you do for us even though we run away from you, even though we are far away or we put other things um, in more uh, importance and before you, that you are always there watching, waiting, and willing to come run through the village to receive us. We love you so much. We ask